Welcome to Coffee and Contemplation with Susan Dunlop. Hello, I'm Susan Dunlop, a professional coach and Three Vital Questions certified facilitator living in Noosa, Australia. If this is the first time you've joined me, welcome. And if you've been tuned in before, thank you so much for coming back. People passionate about what they deliver to the world intrigue me and make me want to know what, how and why they do what they do. I choose to surround myself with people who set visions, take risks to do good things in service of others, people who are kind-hearted, purposeful and wise. In service, in life or in the books they've written, they've changed lives, including their own. Guests joining me on the Coffee and Contemplation podcast are invited to share their personal stories with vulnerability for the benefit of others and are people with either or both professional and experiential knowledge of the theme of each episode. Today's guest is Vicki Spencer, the founder and facilitator of a private group on Facebook called Inspirational Aging. Vicki is a qualified naturopath, a herbalist and personal trainer with over 28 years experience. She's a health education specialist and author of the book Ageless Vitality. I did some pre-chat due diligence, as you do, and what I came to find outside of our initial chat that Vicky and I had some weeks ago is that Vicky is on a mission to change the narrative around ageing. Her objective is to give confidence to women during the perimenopause to postmenopause transition, encouraging women to embrace responsibility and to take control of their health. So Vicky specialises in healthy ageing with an emphasis on movement, herbal medicine, nutrition, and emerging work and meditation. Vicky, I'm about to introduce you to say hello, but I would like to say I'm going to have to probably sign up for all of that. I'm contemplating what you've got to share twofold, one for myself at the stage of life I'm transitioning and also for this show's purpose. So Vicky Spencer of Marichidor in Queensland, welcome. Thank you so much, Susan. That's that's great. As we we're in here in Queensland, melting away in the heat. As I shared earlier, I'm not having air conditioning, so you see me wiping the face. It is hot. I'm not having a hot flush. I'm, it's it's hot weather. So yes, thank you. I think we've got a nice little path that we can follow for our chat today that will really give some meaning to the people listening and I will definitely benefit from learning what you've got to share as well. So what I'd like to start with, if you're okay with this, is to talk about your profession choice of naturopathy and herbalism. Would that be okay to start there? Yeah, I mean, there's so many places we could start, but that seems a a logical place to start. I didn't actually choose to be a naturopath. It wasn't something I grew up you know, making potions in the backyard or, you know, anything like that. But my father was an amazing gardener and very keen with the earth. So I suppose there's that in my heritage. But it really came out of years of literally being covered in eczema for most of my childhood, teenage uh, years. And probably the turning point for me was my early 20s. I was literally covered in eczema. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd be stuck to the sheets, I'd be bleeding, I'd have scratch marks. You couldn't see any normal skin on me. And, you know, through that journey, I'd been from doctor to doctor and pretty much they said, got to live with it. And for many of my younger years, I was literally slathering on cortisone creams. And of course, we know that I liken it to putting a lid on a boiling pot. The body's trying to relieve this inflammation and the skin is trying to do that. And then we're putting that on. It goes, where do I go now? So what I found was it was always coming back and I sort of knew certain triggers, but it wasn't till I was probably in my early 20s, I completely changed what I ate, what I was doing, and it completely transformed my body shape as well as my skin. And it was amazing. I actually went to raw food. Now, I do not recommend people do that necessarily. But for me, like anything with naturopathy, uh, we get caught up in different diets. But changing is just uh, enabling the body to have a bit of a flip going. We don't want to keep going in that trajectory. How do we turn? But then how do we maintain it? So it was in my early 30s that I decided to get into working in a health food shop and I decided to study to be a naturopath because I wanted to come from a place of more knowledge rather than just, well, this sort of work for me. I love plants. From that, I love what the human body is capable of when we give it the right support. So becoming a naturopath and herbalist really was from my own trying to seek answers, which for many people, it is a a commonplace to start. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, gosh, eczema is quite painful, isn't it, to oh. have to live with? <laughs> Most people think I was just a bit richy skin, but it's, you know, it can be raw, it can be dry, it just, it was all my face. It was just, you know, going through your formidable years, like your teenage years, you know, and it's, uh, the skin is what we show to the world. I was chronically shy as a child, like chronically shy. So it's like, it's this internal manifestation of what you're presenting to the world. So it makes perfect yeah. sense now, but at the time, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, good on you for working through it actually to do something for yourself and also then obviously taking that into your, your career. Yeah. I was thinking too, you were saying to, in our chat that you were blessed with different experiences in that evolution into the work of naturopathy and herbalism. So shall we intermingle that into the first section that we're talking about? What, what were the, the blessings that you had? Um, I, I think the first, which wasn't actually a mentor, but what made the change uh, for my skin was I re- wrote, there was a um, journalist in the UK called Leslie Kenton, and she wrote the book Raw Energy and also Ultra Health. She's actually passed now. She was a leader, and I, I still look at her books, and she's amazing at what understanding the power of what the body is capable of of healing but it was when I was studying naturopathy and my children were were young and I needed work and when I was studying I was asked if I wanted to work as a just a secretarial assistant basically at a place called Bioconcepts which was owned by um, one of Australia's leading nutritionists and biochemist, Henry Oziki. And I just get goosebumps when I say that because I still remember Karen who asked me to work. She was the manager of the office. And she come in and she goes, oh, Henry said this. And I, I just looked at her and went, you just call him Henry? Is that You just call him Henry? Because to me, I had him up on this high pedestal. And so I worked there for four years and um, he was amazing biochemistry minds. And in my office, I had these huge biochemical pathways. Well, I had just studied that stage of my course I'd done my chemistry and I think oh my gosh why well, hadn't I met Henry before this I would have really focused so much more because if we understand the processes of what's going on in the body then we're not just treating symptoms we're actually getting to the cause and this is so important because I see even young naturopaths coming now coming through and they get taught protocols clients coming in with this you give them xyz protocol and it just really I, I just go, no, no, that's not what naturopathy is about to me. It really is what's going on for this person. How do they relate to their environment, their food, what stage of their life is going on? How are their emotions? What is all that to help them understand what they're manifesting? So Henry Osiki helped me understand the biochemistry. I then was fortunate to be asked to manage a very busy naturopathic practice um, by Maria Forbes. So that gave me the opportunity to experience she'd been practicing for 10 years so she she wanted to go into politics so I'm stepping into looking at all her client history and I'm opening up all this history so I'm learning what she how she was treating and I was exposed to like quite a few patients each week and that's when I realized I didn't necessarily want to sit in an office and I found I was saying the same thing over and over again because I had receptionist making up the herbs so I wasn't even making up the herbs so I didn't have that fun of putting my witch's hat on and making up the herbs I realized I was saying the same things over and again so I thought you know what I really want to get into education and then I left there and I got a bit of a repping role but then I managed to get my husband at the time I was having a bit of a whinge about what I wanted to do and he goes who's doing what you want to do and I said well the only one I can really think of would be Dr Sandra Cabot And he goes, we'll give her a call. I go, oh, don't be ridiculous, as if she'd take my call. Well, anyway, (laughs) six months later, I'm working with her, and I worked with her for seven and a half years. So Sandra was, she wrote the liver cleansing diet. She was a doctor, um, but we had a naturopathic mind. Um, And what I learned from her, and obviously we did a lot of public talks, she wrote books, and that's where I got the confidence to write my book, Age of Vitality. Uh Yeah, that's probably um, the bit of the journey of the, the mentors and it, the evolution. I think it was the first time I did anything that was a real shift towards better health was I pulled that liver cleansing diet book out <laughs> when yeah. we first moved to Queensland. So our children were young. It cost me a fortune in vegetables and whatever to, <laughs> to follow it. But I remember doing it and feeling like that was that real change in me from you know, typical suburban Sydney living of having your meat and three veg and that way of eating and yeah. I sort of I, I changed the way I saw food and it's the most leafed through book in my 
collection of recipe books here. So would you say of those people you just mentioned, is there a most important professional mentor in all three of those or? Oh, gosh, they all played such a key role in different ways, almost like putting my pieces together. But, you know, then when I um, started to be a personal trainer, I've always been into movement. So there's people I found along the way, like my personal trainer, he actually had um, this uh, terrible brain cancer. He actually went over to Germany and he was he couldn't eat um, and he'd be fed through a tube. So trying to condense the story, but it's like he shouldn't be alive should not be a life. So the gift of seeing beyond what we get told and what possibly is a scenario that we've got this terrible disease and we can't do anything about it, that's one story. Um, and if we choose to believe that, then more than likely we won't have much longer. But, that you know, it's not as simple as that. I'm not trying to simplify it. Pedro, to this day, he's just an amazing physical trainer. As I say, I... I they're all pieces that have helped to develop who I am. And so, yeah, there's no single person there. We'll move on now to talk about your private Facebook group, so mm-hmm. Inspirational Ageing, mm-hmm. and also your book, Ageless Vitality. Mm-hmm. So maybe let's talk around the inspired thoughts, the challenges, what happened that made all that come about? Mm. So Ageless Vitality probably came first. That was a book I wrote probably about 12 years ago. Um, I was um, in my late 40s, and as I say, I was around, I was working with Sandra. And it was interesting because she wanted to publish it and I really wanted to do it on my own because I wanted to have my style. It was challenging, but Ageless Vitality came from a place that I was doing lots of public talks and people would often go, well, they'd be writing notes and that. So I thought if I put it all into a book, then they've got that information there. They can sit and listen. And then if they, you know, a lot of times I just gave the books away. And uh, But it was interesting when the book came out, I think it was when the I'd done the artwork for the book and I got the print of what the cover would be like. And I can still remember this week so clearly. <laughs> um, the book came out. I was very excited. My daughter got engaged. Very exciting. And I got diagnosed with breast cancer. <laughs> Not so exciting. So I had people coming up to me going, oh, Vicky, I heard about your book. That's exciting. I'm going, yeah, yeah, that is. And then they tell me, Alicia's getting America, yeah, that's it. And then someone else would hear that's the other side. So uh, that came out. I got diagnosed after the book came out. So that sort of story is not in there. And that sort of taught me not to get caught in, you know, we can get caught in high emotions, low emotions. It's like, how do we ride this wave? And with that, then obviously I went on another journey going through uh, breast cancer. So I was going through perimenopause and menopause at that stage. And the, which is really common, these things happen at that time. And it was really after that and just noticing the dramatic change that happens once we go through menopause. So menopause is pretty much 12 months of not having a period. It's pretty much one day. And then from then we're post-menopause. So just knowing when that estrogen starts to drop, the changes in the body. And women have been kept out of the research for so much of um, health and fitness. So much of the information women are following on health and fitness is based on men and not only average men, it's 18 to 25-year-olds. So it's only in the last probably five to 10 years we've got an amazing female scientist coming through changing that and it's actually been mandated now women have to be included but because we have these hormonal cycles we've got too many variables or women might be on the pill so there's too many variables for these studies so women had been excluded so for me inspirational aging came from a place it sort of planted a little bit of a seed in my head maybe three years ago I was witnessing this neighbor I had and she was in her late 80s and um, she was told she had diabetes she didn't want to believe it and no doctor wanted to help her. So she actually got on the internet, I think it's about 88, got on the internet and contacted this doctor in Canada and told her to eat this, eat this, this and this and do this exercise. And she's just amazing. She's just so, she was inspirational. It gave me the idea, oh, this is what I believe aging should be about. Yes, we, our body's going to change. And it's not about holding on to youth. It's actually embracing that wisdom that we've gathered over the years and um, being proud of our life, being proud of the wrinkles, the grey hair, and embracing it all, but also looking after the body, looking after our spirit, looking after our soul, and being authentic. 
So Inspirational Aging is a private group that it is for people that I suppose understand it's not just about the physical body and it's not a quick fix. This is about a daily practice and what I share on there are any articles I might find. Um, it might be new fitness, it might be regimes. I'm doing a, a webinar talk next week on the fascia. So the fascia is part of <laughs> our matrix of our body that really helps with flexibility and movement in all facets of our body. It, you know, then it might be uh, recipes I find, or it might be a book I've read, or something on hormonal issues, or something I might find comes up in just topics of conversation, and then I might just do a little video clip giving my perception of it, just to, yeah, support and help change that narrative. So it's not all doom and gloom, especially yeah. when you're over 50. Yeah. So from a credible source, in other words, which I think is always something I always look towards when I'm looking to follow anything. It's also yeah. what I love too. I gain so much from it as well. And, you know, people send me little messages. I, I sort of each morning I see the sunrise and I'll post my sunrise photo and maybe a motivational quote or something like that. And now and again, I'll just someone say, oh, Vicky, I just really appreciate that it's just nice to have that motivation and I go oh that's that's great I'm glad it's reaching one person two people you know what I mean yeah it's um yeah and it helps me too the the emotional mix that comes about when you're trying to work out whether it's perimenopause or whether it's someone else and all of that type of thing do you get a sense that women are feeling quite alone in this space there's I think there's two camps there's the ones that go just blame it on menopause and go oh this is where I am can't do anything about it poor me, I hate it. And then there's the others that withdraw because I my, I think we shared when we had initial chat, to me, I believe that menopause is a transition. It's we can't take our old life that does not serve us into the next stage. So I think every woman needs to retreat in some fashion to actually review what is, who is she? What does she want to carry forward? How does she find that? So it is a time of really regrouping. And that's where, yes, it can seem isolating, but that's when you can only really find your authenticity if you yeah. spend that time in reflection. So, yeah, okay. it's, it's really for definitely three to five years. It really is a, such a, a fluxing time. There's so many things going on in that time. When I went through... My mother was going into a nursing home. My daughter was having her first bub. I was at the height of my career. I was flying around Australia, feeling fantastic. But in the meantime, I was going, whoa, where am I going? <laughs> it's like, okay, I can do this, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I can promise being over the other side, it's okay. You know, we don't fall off the cliff. We're, we're okay and it's, it's okay. It's, it's good. We're not driven by that, our fertility cycle. We're not driven by that need to bring forth life or that menstrual, you know, that hormonal urge, we, our energy goes into, we find who we are, I believe. So you are, you're changing the narrative on perimenopause and menopause, trying to take away the mystery and confusion with information. So let's talk about that and how you're helping women. Aside from the Facebook group, what else do you do to, to get this out um, to people? I do community talks, public talks. As I say, a webinars which are open to anybody. I also work as a naturopath in a pharmacy, um, which I love because I'm getting to people that may not normally see someone about natural medicine. They've got the reassurance of mainstream. And when you've got the support of mainstream medicine mixed, it shouldn't, to my way of thinking, because I've worked with Sandra and she was a doctor, naturopaths didn't like her because she was a doctor. Doctors didn't like her because she was a naturopath. So it really is, it's not about alternative medicine. It's about medicine. You know, it's about health. And it's not an either or. So being in this situation, I, I have people I speak to every day. And a lot of people are dealing with stress. And so for women going through perimenopause and menopause, one of the best things she can do is understand and support her adrenals. Her adrenal glands they have to start regulating her hormones and also the fat cells. That's why we put the weight on. It is normal to put the weight on. I know we don't like it. I know we don't want it. And if I hear women go, I just want my body the way it was, it can't be. It can't be. And the alternative of not going through menopause is not an option. 
you don't want that option okay so for me it really is giving that confidence and going through basics of what you can do in your day to set a foundation for good health to allow then the hormones to do their dance which they will do but at least they're not fluctuating and dipping and all over the place when you're not you're not going to bed at the same time or you're not eating well or you're not drinking and moving your body so if you get the basics of what a healthy body needs then the hormones can do their dance which they will do because that's the natural way we're going through this time in our life just like we go through puberty yeah puberty was all exciting we're going to become a woman yay this is fantastic and it's exciting um but we don't have that same excitement but we can do because we can let go of what we've been told and start to look for role models that are showing us that it can be great over the other side. So I think that mm-hmm. that shift is happening. So I think it's reassuring people on many levels of where I cross in my life that when we support our body in a positive way, then you know it, it's not just the physical body, but when you really are comfortable in your own skin, then each day is a gift and it really is easy when you just get into this is my life and this is what are you going to do that day it's not looking beyond that it's living in the moment supporting yourself and understanding what drives you there was a time in my life when I've, I've had many dark times and before we had the internet and social media you'd buy magazines well I went through a phase where I had one of those visual diaries and I put I take out pictures and I'd have different pages where This is the environment I like to live. This is the food I like to eat. These are the people that motivated me, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd have all these different pages. So when I had difficult times, I'd flick through this and I'd go, oh, yeah, that's what makes me feel good. And that feel good, we all know when we we realise it and we feel good from the inside out, that's when you know you're living authentically. And that's what I wish for everybody to not try and do this and try and do that and switch as supposed to. I'm doing this because they tell me how does it feel for you and is it right for you? Mm. So so when you were talking about working in the naturopath uh, position in the pharmacy yeah. and I'm sitting here going, mm, that's me, that's who I would go to and I would self-diagnose what particular herbs I need to take now. I rarely go to my GP apart from, you know, the pap smear thing is all I ever really had to go for. I don't see a naturopath anymore. It's almost like I'm sort of pulled back to just not want to know what's happening. Do you find that is something that happens regularly or is it just me? No, it's not just you. Okay. I know <laughs> I know you. we could just say it's just you, Susan, but it's not um, because there is so much information out there and whatever we look for, we will find. So if you want affirmation, you're on the right track, you will find that. If you want confirmation, that's not the right thing to do, you will find that as well. Uh, The trouble you've got when you're self-diagnosing and self-treating is often we don't see what we, we don't see what we don't want to see and we don't know what we don't know. The most important thing is we don't know what we don't know. So I'm not saying you have to go to a doctor. I'm not saying you have to go to a naturopath. But what I would advise, if you want to look after yourself the best before you choose a doctor and finding a naturopath that keep a journal for three to six months and know who you are go to the doctor and get blood tests it doesn't even have to be you just go to the doctor and say i could just like to get some bloods done i recommend everyone get bloods done at least every 12 months because what happens and i hear this repeatedly uh, people will come in and say have you had your blood test have you had a blood test for that let's choose I know iron is a classic and even vitamin D is a classic. And I, they'll come in and they'll want an iron supplement. They'll have your iron checked. No, I'm just feeling tired. I'm going, well, you need to know whether you need iron because too much iron can be detrimental. So that's where a blood test is important. Uh, vitamin D is another one. Uh, the range in Australia for vitamin D is between 60 and 150 on a blood test. It's not a regular blood test. It's something you generally have to request. And it can only be done in 12 months. The number of times I say to people, have your vitamin D checked? They go, oh, yeah, it's normal. I said, do you know what it is? And they go, no. So you don't know how much to take if you don't know what your range is. So when I got diagnosed, before I got cancer, I got autoimmune. And my vitamin D then was 32. Vitamin D is a precursor to our hormones. Um, It's important for calcium. 
it's extremely important for the body. It's the sun. We get it from the sun. Anyway, so long story, trying to keep short. Um, I've got my vitamin D up and some people don't hold on to it because most vitamin D supplements are a 1,000 international IU. So most people think I'm just taking one a day. Well, for my level at 32, if I just took one a day, it would do nothing. So I actually had to take quite a high dose, which I got from my doctor. He put me on for three months to get it up. I got over 100 and then thinking, okay, great, it's up. But after six months, it dropped again. So some of us don't hold it. So, so important, get your blood test. You know where you are in that range because the doctor will say, oh, this is your in range. Well, that's good. But where are you in that range and are you moving in that range? So this, you can only have that conversation if you had your blood test regularly and the doctor can see, well, actually, oh, actually, there's a drop here on whatever test you're doing. And with each pathology, there'll be a slight variance. So it's not just one or two little in increments, but if it's dropping and you're changing, like a class one classic would be thyroid. Thyroid is a common one um, in perimenopause phase and um, you know, just checking TSH, that gives you goalposts or what your thyroid's doing. And so many people go, oh, yeah, we told it's normal. Well, it's working at where you are in that range and is it changing for possibly 12 months ago? Then you know. Then you can ask more questions and then possibly then you're getting more blood tests to get more information to make dietary changes and then know what supplements at what amounts you're meant to take. And then you go back, get it checked again, if that helps. Okay. I think that was a very personal sort of feeling question that I needed to ask. So, but No, it's a really um, common one, I promise you. It's super, super common because the information's there on the internet and everyone mm -hmm. thinks, well, okay, that's there. I just had to take this. I had this classic example yesterday. This woman's husband had been diagnosed with this post-viral condition and she would Googled and got this, the supplement she needed. And I said, did anyone advise you to take this? She goes, no, no. And I said, well, these aren't actually treating the virus. They're just treating the symptoms. So there's, yeah. you know, yeah, it is... It pays to talk to someone and it, whether you take that information on, take that advice, but gather the information. That would be yeah. my advice. I feel like I diagnose by feeling and I don't know. That's obviously not a safe thing to do either. So anyway, message on board. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're coming close to the end already. But if you could go back and give your seven-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Don't give men the power. Sorry, I've, I've been married twice and I've had relationships where... I've given my esteem away to other people's opinion and I grew up in a family where men had authority and you know, women are seen and not heard. You know, girls need to look a certain way. So I was very much indoctrinated with that. So I would tell my little seven-year-old self that um, I'm important and to use my voice and um, get out there and give it a shot. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so do you have a go-to mantra or an affirmation that you um, use when you need to get through a challenge? Well, this could take us down another ta tangent, but there's a technique called a ponopono. Um, it's an Hawaiian technique and it uh, carries me through any time I really don't know the answer or I'm not sure what to do. Um, I'm trying to think of this name that set it up, but uh, pretty much in it's talking. If you feel yourself reacting in a situation where you don't know, and this is not for the other person, but it's for your inner, deeper self. And so, for example, something might come up that I wish I wish I hadn't done something a certain way. And I will say to myself, please forgive me. I'm sorry. I love you. Thank you. And I say it to myself and I feel it. And you'll say it over and over again. And you'll feel it resonate. And what you're doing is not dismissing what's happening or it could be something someone else is triggering you or you want something a certain way and it's not happening and you just it's it's really for me it resonates um internally and it could be you might say i love you first please forgive me i'm sorry thank you and then it could be thank you you know something's happened and it's looking for the good things as well it's going thank you i love you please forgive me I'm sorry, you know, I just it's it's feeling those things and that I, I would say would be the first thing that comes to mind. That's a gift, isn't it? I, I could feel that in my heart when you said it. I was like, oh, that is so yeah. lovely to say to yourself. Yeah, is, I get yeah. that. So I just want to say thank you, Vicky, for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to have you and you know, just to share the origin of the work that you do and what makes you you. And I think the work that you're doing 
is just so beneficial to many, many women and, and the people that are attached to those women because obviously anything that makes a woman change it also sort of lights up the world around us. So, yeah, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you so much and thank you for what you're doing, Susan, and a welcome to uh, grandmotherhood, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> Which is very exciting. <laughs> very exciting. So enjoy that uh, journey as yeah. well. Mm. It is. It's a really interesting time of life, this time of life. As I said, I can feel that space of being surrounded with the, the wise woman and being feeling into that myself now. And yeah. it's quite a beautiful space to be in. Yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. I'm forever thankful to people like Vicky and I'm sure that you've appreciated what Vicky shared, whether you took that one snippet like I did to go and get your bloods done. It's just interesting just to take in some other person's story and Vicky was put forward by a very good friend of mine. She said, this woman's going to be interesting, get her on the show. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm very grateful for that referral. So if you would like to join me as a guest to talk about your dreams, your interesting life journey and how you're changing lives, please don't hesitate to reach out and chat. And in the meantime, just trust that you are blessed, even when you forget that you are blessed and take care of yourself. And I look forward to being back soon. So bye for now. 